Hey everybody, so we're going to be looking at chapter 13 here, uh, expansion, war, sectional crisis. Um, we'll be looking at manifest destiny, the expansion of America from coast to coast. Um, we'll be looking at some very distinct direct causes of the American Civil War, which will be the next chapter, uh, the next chapter we talk about. We'll look at some disputed territories. We'll look at the election of 44. We'll look at uh, the war with Mexico. We'll look at um, Abraham Lincoln, California, uh, crisis of 1850, Kansas, Nebraska, things like that. So uh, several different things to cover in this chapter. So we shall get started. All right, Manifest Destiny. What is that? It's an ideology. Um, it's an ideology of conquest. Uh, proclaims that Americans, white Americans really, uh, have a God-given duty to extend American republicanism and capitalism all the way to the Pacific Ocean. So this this idea that Americans must and again, it's sort of God-directed, God-given uh, duty that we must spread the idea of American republicanism and capitalism from coast to coast, all the way across North America. Uh, it's our responsibility. Um, interesting, interesting. Well, we're going to start with this uh, manifest destiny and the push to the Pacific, push to the Pacific Ocean. We'll start here with Oregon. Oregon, really, it's Oregon Territory, really. Oregon Territory was claimed by both England and the U.S. This is pretty much the last area um, in what becomes the United States that England has any say about. Uh, and they want to try and slow us down. They want to try and hold on to the territory because the Oregon-Washington region is really great. Uh, great lands, great harbors, lots of great fishing, very fertile and certainly valuable. Both nations have an interest. By the 1840s, we see thousands of British and thousands of Americans settled in this Oregon Territory. Uh, this begins what we refer to as the Oregon Fever. Um, the Oregon Fever is sort of generic. It refers in general to this desire to, to conquer the West to go westward and to move out there uh, as quickly as possible to expand and grow our country and to get all of the great land first. Because many people understood the land was great. It was fertile, it was great harbors, great farmland. So it's sort of this rush to get it while it's good, before it's gone, before someone else comes and takes all the land. People rush out there with wagons and ox, cattle, by the thousands. Um, they migrate along what they usually call the Oregon Trail um, to settle Oregon and California as well, to settle Oregon and the California Territory. By 1860, we have almost a quarter million, almost a quarter million settlers out there. Uh, uh, give or take, 35,000 die along the way. You might think Native Americans, no. A uh, few, but most die of, of natural reasons, natural causes. Uh, going across the Midwest desert, starvation, dehydration, malnutrition, disease, injury, uh, sunstroke, or frozen. They cross the mountains in the winter and they get frozen in and they freeze to death, um, starve to death, all that kind of stuff. So very few die of, of conflict. Most die of, uh, in essence, natural nature, climate. Uh, foolishness, uh, things like this. This 2,000 mile journey, which is from around, that would probably be from around Chicago-ish, all the way out to Oregon and San Francisco. The largest early settlement in Willamette Valley. Uh, this was the largest early settlement in the Oregon Territory. Uh, by the 1840s alone, had over 10,000 population. And bear in mind, this is still a territory. It's not officially claimed by anybody. Or I suppose I should say that differently. It's actually claimed by multiple people. Um, the settlers claim it. The United States claims it. England claims it. And hell, there's some Russians out there too. 
there's there's some Russians in a couple of settlements and territories out there. I don't know if Russia actually thought they had a real claim, but there's there's hundreds, maybe thousands of Russians in Northern California. Uh, so yeah, lots of people claim this territory really. Uh, immediately, it becomes a reflection of life back east. It becomes a racially discriminatory society, restricting all voting to white men and all land ownership to white men. Immediately. Uh, a reflection of the way life was back east. Um, yeah. About 3,000 migrants make it to California in the 1840s. About 3,000 in California. Uh, bear in mind, California was Mexico. California was part of Mexico. It was a, one of their provinces. Uh, so these were Americans moving into a foreign country and settling there like it was their land to do what they wanted with. Now, uh, California had very few Mexican people. Even though it was part of Mexico, it was really almost, eh, it was a technicality because Mexico had recently declared independence from Spain back in 21. So Mexico was a brand new country. Uh, their territory was massive. It was pretty much all of New Spain was now Mexico. Stretched all the way down uh, to, to lower Central America, all the way up to the Oregon Territory. It was a massive amount of territory, and Mexico couldn't even begin to administer it and control it or protect it. So, yeah, they had missions and a few military forts, but frankly, not much. Uh, there were Native Americans in there. The Native Americans were freed when Mexico became independent. Uh, freed. The Native Americans had been treated as slaves by the Spanish. They were pretty much being used as as uh, slaves, as encomiendas. The encomiendas are the Spanish version of the of the slave plantation, only they were using Indians on them. Uh, so they're free now. So we have these Native Americans that have been enslaved, and now they have been freed. Uh, and the Mexicans generally live peaceful with them, because both of them considered that they were subjugated, alienated peoples of Spain. So they have a lot in common. Um, Mexico let, gave out the land freely to the Americans. The more and more Americans showed up, they started to just give them land grants. They gave them deeds to the land, many of them. Um, what they wanted them to do was to raise cattle, um, raise cattle for Mexico. Again, they're Mexico. It was supposed to generate revenue, generate meat, and generate work and productivity for Mexico. Well, many of these people didn't want to assimilate into Mexican lifestyle. They didn't want to be part of it. They didn't want to be Mexico. Most of them were Americans. Or they came here from a foreign country planning to be in America. And they came to the West Coast and they simply wanted this to be America, uh, the United States. Um, they really simply wanted to colonize the region and then to ask the U.S. to admit them into the Union. That's what they wanted. Uh, well, we know that's eventually what happens. Uh, so yeah, leather business was huge. They didn't, they didn't, it wasn't the cattle business for milk. It wasn't the cattle business for meat. They slaughtered the cattle for leather goods. They would slaughter them, skin them. Uh, sometimes the meat would simply go to waste. It was the pro the leather products, which are really expensive, that they would ship back East to be made into leather goods, leather clothing and things like that, Boot, boots and shoes and belts and whatever. Um, yeah. They didn't, they didn't, it wasn't for the meat that they wanted the cattle. They wanted to be annexed by the United States and they did not really assimilate. They didn't have any interest in being part of Mexico. It isn't like they lied to Mexico. Uh, it isn't that Mexico believed they were coming here to join them. I just think Mexico perhaps didn't realize how much the U.S. wanted our country from coast to coast. <coughs> anyway. They're in for a big surprise, unfortunately, for them. Here we have the territorial conflict here. Um, 1819 to 1846. We see the Oregon Trail, which led the Oregon Fever people out to Willamette Valley, which was like a Garden of Eden on the West Coast. It really was. You have Portland there, Fort Victoria. Um, up here, you have Canada. And so, yeah, there's a lot of debate uh, when they're they're arguing this back and forth. Who really owns this territory? England claimed it. We claimed it. Uh, mixture. A lot of mixture. Eventually, we get most of it. We get most of the territory eventually. And this is pretty much what becomes Oregon and Washington. 
But we're going to talk more about this because this has large impact upon what happens with Texas and Mexico. All of this is connected, as we're going to get into. This is an interesting discussion question. All right, this is a settlement of Oregon City. Oregon City. Describe it, first of all. That's your first part of the discussion question. Describe what you see. So give me a paragraph on what you see on both sides of the river. Those are Native Americans on the left side, by the way. And uh, it's Oregon City there on the right. Describe the biggest buildings you see, what kind of buildings they are, what you think they are. Now, you have four Native Americans on the other side. Now, why was this drawn this way? This is, this is drawn by a British military officer. Why did he choose to draw it this way? Um, what do you think? What do you think is the purpose of showing the Indians there? Uh, the land on the other side of the river. Whose land had that been until just recently? And what is the English officer stating, without using words, by putting the Indians on the other side? While this land on the right, which had been Indian lands at some point, is now being settled by Europeans or Americans. What's he mean? What's the purpose of this? How does the river figure into this? There's a literal meaning and a figurative meaning of this divided picture. Think about all that. So you got to think about the river, the land, the purpose of why the British officer did it. What was he trying to say? Um, yeah, I mean, you don't need to overthink it. It's actually pretty obvious. I mean, if you really look at it for a minute, think about this, you know, from the uh, European American perspective, you know, what are they saying about the Indians? Uh, and you could even go so far as to include what do you think the Native Americans think? What do you think they think about this situation? What are they looking across the river thinking? It's really, um, it's really good. Uh, lots of interesting stuff in this image. Good discussion question. Um, what do you have here? Uh, you see the Oregon Trail we talked about, but look at all these other trails. Spanish Trail, Santa Fe Trail, Mormon, California. Yeah, the Pony Express, the mail route. Uh, Overland mail route, Camino Real. That's here in California, what we call Highway 1, Pacific Coast Highway, Camino Real. Goes all the way down to San Diego. All the way up to at least San Francisco. Yep, San Francisco right there. Anyway. This trip from Illinois all the way out here, almost 2,000 miles. It wasn't a straight line. They had to go through deserts. They had to go through mountains. Uh, the journey took months. So part of the time, they're freezing to death. The other part of the time, they're dying of heat, uh, heat stroke and, and dehydration. They don't know where the water is. They don't know. I mean, most of them had no idea that this was going to be involved. They ran out of food. It was, it was pretty bad. I say about uh, what about 35,000 35, out of 250,000 died. That is what, sure, I don't know, 17%. It's a lot. <laughs> That's a high mortality rate. 17% of the people didn't ever make it. Uh, some turned around. It should also be noted that too. Uh, about one third of all the people that went west never made it. Some of them died, but the other portion just turned around and went back. Yeah, I mean, there's a few that stopped along the way and just settled along the way, and they settled a few towns and communities, but um, some simply went back. All right, let's go on further into the Manifest Destiny and the election of 1844. Presidential election of 44 significantly altered our policy in the West. This is how. All right. Many people in the South wanted Texas. They wanted Texas annexed. Now, why did the many, why did the people in the South want Texas? It was for slave expansion. It was to expand slavery. 
That's why they wanted Texas. All right. So they want the expansion of slavery into Texas. Texas is a huge territory. It's part of Mexico. And they wanted us to annex it and take it away from Mexico. All right. To expand cotton and to expand slavery. Now, in 1843, several frontier states got together and organized these conventions, these rallies. And these become collectively known as Oregon Conventions. Now, they're not in Oregon. These are in basically the United States, the border regions, generally speaking around the Mississippi River area, all the way up from Canada, all the way down to Mississippi, all the way down to Louisiana. Generally, these frontier regions, they want America to expand and keep growing and keep moving westward. And so they organize these conventions. Now, these conventions are on both sides. And remember, at this point in time, who's the political parties? The Democrats, because of Jackson, and the Whigs. Remember, this is the Whigs right now. This is the Whig Party. This would actually be under President Tyler after William Henry Harrison died and all that craziness with Tyler getting kicked out of the party. And But he's president here um, until this election. All right. So the Whigs and the Democrats both generally call for control of the Oregon Territory. They want Oregon. They want that territory. That's going to give them the foothold on the West Coast. Manifest Destiny says we need to go all the way to the ocean. So if we control the Oregon Territory, we've got it. We now have our foothold on the West. We control half of the North America. It's only logical that we will connect the two. And we will bring it all the way across coast to coast. That's the logic. Not to mention, we we're already starting to build railroads. We've got, we've got railroads that we're trying to connect. It doesn't happen yet, but we're already expanding railroads, hoping to connect them soon. And then we're really bringing East and West together. Um, so these conventions call for control of Oregon, believing it is our destiny to move forward and control this. Um, this was the region that pretty much went from about 5440, which is latitude, about 5440 latitude, all the way up to Canada. Well, no. Actually, what they were calling for was all the way to Alaska. To be, to be truthful, we don't get all that. But they were actually calling from 5440, which is around Oregon, not up to Canada, but actually all the way to Alaska. All the way up, all the way up is what they wanted. Um, and that's these Oregon conventions. Now, I started with Texas because Texas is going to become a big part of this. Uh, yeah, definitely Texas is going to be part of this. All right. The election of 1844. Now, the Tyler administration tried to annex Texas. Remember, Tyler's president. He does try to take Texas because so many people wanted Texas. All right. Now, Martin Van Buren and Henry Clay, who are both running for president, they opposed him doing this. They did not want him adding Texas like this. Now, they didn't want, it isn't that they didn't want slavery added. Don't misunderstand. I don't think Clay was for slavery, but Van Buren was a Democrat, so he didn't have a problem with slavery. The problem was the debate over slavery. Because if we add a new state in the South, that therefore forces a debate on slavery. Because it's simple. Will Texas be added as a slave state? Texas is a huge territory. It will dramatically increase the size of slavery. I mean, Texas alone is as big as three other slave states. So to add Texas as a new state, and then, of course, the debate over slavery is forced because of its location and the fact that Southerners want it extended as, as, slave, as a slave state. The fear is if we debate slavery, it will lead us into war and disunion. That has been talked about for years. Remember what I said in uh, a previous chapter? I think there was actually even a rule in Congress, a gag rule, that prohibited even discussing slavery in Congress. They couldn't even bring it up. It was against the law uh, or against the rules of Congress to even discuss slavery. I think it was like for eight years, for something like eight years, right in this time period. They were so scared of talking about expanding slavery because they feared it would lead us to war. Well, they were right. Anyway, so they don't want this. They don't want this done. Van Buren doesn't want it done. Harry Clay doesn't want it. Now, the Whigs wouldn't want this done normally because the Whigs are really anti-slave. But remember what we said, Tyler really wasn't a Whig. 
As soon as Tyler takes over after uh, Henry, William Henry Harrison dies, Tyler immediately starts instituting democratic policies. He was a Democrat, uh, but he'd, he'd run as a Whig. Um, he really was a Democrat. So he, want, he was actually pro-slave. All right. Well, so this whole election pretty much centers on the different discussions over Texas, Oregon, and slavery. That's really what this whole election is about. Texas, Oregon, and slavery is really what it's about. Um, so we have different candidates supporting the taking Texas um, and Oregon. Uh, most of them actually support Texas and Oregon, um, but they simply want to somehow avoid the slave issue, try to avoid it. Uh, so the debate goes many different ways, all kinds of different debates uh, about how to do it, what to do, um, who and wh how would they be admitted, when would they be admitted, would it be slave, would it be free, uh, what about Mexico, what about Mexico, because Texas was still part of Mexico, so that's also an issue, what if we took Texas, is that going to send us into war with Mexico, lots of, lots of problems, lots of issues, um, James Polk is eventually chosen by the Democratic Party. Uh, he is chosen eventually, even though Van Buren, uh, hell, I think Van Buren even runs again. Van Buren ran for president like four or five times. He was president once from what was it, uh, 36 to 40, I think. But he uh, he ran like four different times. Um, yeah, you know, he was a, you gotta admit, he really was a try hard kind of guy. He certainly was. Anyway. The Democrats are concerned about Van Buren. He's simply a losing horse. I mean, he's lost in the past. He's lost multiple times. Um, he's a bit of a polarizing figure. You either hate him or love him. So they want a more of a middle of the road guy, and they choose James Polk. A little more moderate, a little more middle of the road, um, a little better reputation, uh, not quite such a hothead in some ways. Polk is chosen by the Democrats, and the campaign slogan they choose is... 54 40 or fight. I'm sure that's just the way they said it. 54 40 or fight. So that is a reference to the line, a reference to the latitude line. 54 40 or fight. To show support for claiming all of Oregon, all the way up to Alaska and Texas as well. So we're going to take Texas, we're going to take Oregon. However, wait a second, what about slavery? Polk's entire campaign completely ignores slavery. That's his way of getting around the slave issue. He doesn't even discuss it. He acts like it's not, it's not even there, which, of course, is ridiculous. Everyone knows on both sides of the aisle that as soon as Texas is added, the very next discussion is slave. Is, is Texas going to be a slave state? That's literally the very next words out of their mouth. So Polk completely ignores the issue of slavery. And all he desires, his entire campaign is simply about expanding America and growing using Manifest Destiny. And he wins. Um, some people probably thought slavery wasn't going to be an issue. Foolish, foolishly. But the people who really knew just understood that Polk was simply ignoring the, uh, how do we say it, the elephant in the room? Simply ignoring it. All right. He wins using this 54 40 year slogan, the idea of expansion and growing America from sea to shining sea, completely ignoring the slave issue. Texas is then added as a new state in 1845, um, as the 28th state uh, in 1845. Oh, wait, Texas is still technically part of Mexico. Yeah, well, that leads us into our next problem. Texas is now actually part of two countries. We know where that inevitably leads. All right. So, another great discussion question. Damn, I've got two great ones here. I'd love to, to do this one too. I guess I'm going to have to decide what's the best one to do. Um, John Gast, American Progress. First of all, identify all the symbols of westward expansion in here. By gosh, there's a lot. This is America over here expanding westward to the this western United States to the uh, un, uh, un uncolonized unsettled territories. So look at all the elements of westward expansion. There are oh my gosh, there's probably a dozen things on here. Um, think about all the things that indicate uh, American progress going westward. 
from technologies to people. I mean, there's just so many things. I don't want to give it away. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a dozen things you can talk about. All right. Now, what about the woman in the middle? Who does she represent? Who is she? Um, she's a metaphor, right? A metaphor, I think. What's she a metaphor for? What is she a metaphor for? Well, what have we been talking about? So she represents that. She represents what we've been speaking about. Um, her book says, I believe something like, like, what's it say on there? Um, I know you certainly don't need to see me this close to the screen, do you? Oh, well, you got to see me up close and personal there. It says school book. What does that mean? Don't get me wrong. She's not a teacher. She doesn't represent a teacher. So don't, don't think that she represents what we've been talking about. Um, uh, she's carrying a school book. Now that represents something else, obviously what that represents. Um, well, obvious to me, maybe not to you. I hope so. I don't want to give it away. All right. So we have, man, oh, I almost said it. Look at that. I almost said it. We have the topic and the idea behind this. Um, and a progress. Here's the flip side. Who's progress? Okay, American progress. Well, if Americans are progressing westward and they're taking all that land, making it part of America, who is not progressing? Who, who is losing out? Who is getting royally shafted? That's also very obvious. Although not necessarily who, but what as well. So not just a who, but also what. See if you can figure out what I mean by that. Uh, so it's not just who, but also what is, is getting really changed. So the progress here is obvious who it is and whose progress is not. Um, uh, who is coming out on the top of this? Who is uh, benefiting? Who is not benefiting? Um, who's gaining? Who's losing? Um, what about color? I didn't mention that. What about the color in this? If you notice, it's very obvious. The right side is light and bright, like the shining sun coming up over the horizon and the new dawn. What is the left side? Dark, shadowy, cloudy. Um, that should be obvious too, what that, re what that represents. Uh, so we have socio-cultural, political, religious overtones in this uh technological overtones um everything pictures worth a thousand words you could write me a whole essay paper on this so if a question comes up for discussion give me a couple paragraphs at least really talking about those themes i just talked about all the stuff i just mentioned all right war expansion and slavery in case the words cut off there for you slavery 46 to 50 the war with mexico all right so, Texas votes to leave Mexico and join the U.S. It doesn't work that way. Uh, part of a country can't just get up and say, you know what, we don't want to be part of country X anymore. We're going to leave your country and we're going to join country Y. You really can't do that. That land isn't your land. That land technically is owned by the country. It's part of the country. You can't just decide, ah, you know, we're just not going to be part of your country anymore. Nonetheless, they do. Texas votes to leave Mexico, join the U.S. Mexico immediately breaks off all diplomatic relations with the U.S. Polk also begins efforts to go ahead and take other territories. He goes ahead and tries to take uh, California, New Mexico. Uh, he felt he had nothing to lose. They're already trying to take the West Coast, uh, Oregon Territory. California's right there. They're going to take Texas. He looks at a map and says, hell, let's just get it all. We're already taking this and we're taking that with a big gap in the middle. Why do we want a gap in the middle? We're doing this and this. Let's just get it all. Um, Congress never approved that. Congress approved Texas. Congress approved Oregon. Congress never approved California. Congress never approved Arizona or New Mexico or none of the rest of that territory. What Polk does is unprecedented. It is war. It is, um, he keeps it private for a long time. He basically sends the military in to do his, to do, to do his dirty work for him without actually going through Congress. Congress has a total authority over all this. He completely circumvents Congress and does it all on his own through his own authority, which he didn't have the right to do. Uh, 
yeah, Congress approve. It's like Congress approving, you know, five dollars, and Polk decides he's going for twenty bucks, and he's just gonna go for it all. Uh, well, I mean, it worked out. Obviously, we know we know the result, but it was really not appropriate. It was not approved by Congress. The American people didn't approve it. Although it should be noted, afterwards, the American people were fine with it. Public opinion is very supportive of what Polk does after the fact. Uh, he sends a couple thousand soldiers down there uh, to occupy Texas all the way over to California. He contacts militiamen in California and asks them to actually start taking over cities in California. And he just he just starts making organizations and a whole uh, or he starts making a whole um, he starts making all these plans with his military officers, with his with his generals and with other people in California who are working with him, uh, because California, those people in California also want to join the US. It just all works together. Um, and pretty much overnight, we are at war with Mexico over Texas and California. It happens quickly. Um, the US Army is led by General Zachary Taylor. He marches into Mexico from Texas. Uh, the same year began, 1846. Um, U.S. controlled all of northern Mexico. We're not just talking about what becomes the U.S. Pretty much everything in what is northern Mexico today, uh, going down hundreds of miles, which is all Mexico today, all of that was under the U.S. control. We controlled everything from Texas to California and hundreds of miles actually further south into the further into the interior of Mexico uh, within just a matter of months. California was officially secured in 47, Texas uh, secured in 46. Fighting continues, though, for a while. Santa Ana comes along, General Santa Ana of Mexico. He comes along, he fights. He actually uh, surrounded Taylor's army in Buena Vista, which is in northern Mexico, and almost defeats him. Taylor barely escapes. Uh, I don't know if he would have been killed, his army would have been killed or, or captured, but uh, Santa Ana almost. Almost, uh, well, he forces Taylor just to retreat. He forces Taylor to actually run away. Um, so the overland attack into Mexico is now starting to falter. And the president, Polk, starts to fear that, oh my gosh, what if Santa Ana gets a bigger army, keeps going? He might actually retake Texas or retake uh, California. Because by 47, we now control Texas and California. Uh, and with Zachary Taylor's defeat, and Zachary Taylor's retreat, there's a there's a sincere fear that Santa Ana might rally the Mexican army and actually take those lands back. Could have happened. I think we know, looking back on it now, Santa Ana didn't have that type of uh, military. He just didn't have that many soldiers. It probably wouldn't have happened. But Polk doesn't know this. All he knows is his general has been defeated, his army's been defeated, and Santa Ana's on the move. So he sends Winfield Scott with a navy down to Mexico City, and they invade Mexico City, and they take over Mexico City. So they take over, which I, that's the capital, right? I assume it was the capital back then as well. They overtake uh, Mexico City and conquer the city and uh, occupy it. Mexico City is now in the, under the authority of the U.S. Marines and, um, and uh, the Navy. Well, what this does is it forces Santa Ana to surrender. Santa Ana has to surrender, uh, believing he can't win this fight also because he doesn't want to lose Mexico City. Or there was a fear as well that the Americans might simply destroy Mexico City. They might bomb it or, you know, with, with cannons and naval cannons, they might burn the city down. Um, anyway, Mexico surrenders. Um, the war ends. It's about a year. The war lasts about a year. It's pretty one-sided. Other than the defeat of Zachary Taylor, it's pretty one-sided. It's mostly American victories. Um, Mexico was still a brand new country. It was still a fledgling country. They really hadn't gotten on their feet yet. They really weren't ready for a war with the U.S. The U.S. was economically far stronger than Mexico. Uh, the U.S. economy was literally 10 times bigger. It was about uh, eight times, eight times bigger than the Mexican economy. I don't know militarily, I don't know about that, but the economy was way bigger, way stronger. Um, 
Mexico just wasn't ready for something like this. Had they had, they had another 20 years, who knows? Maybe it would have turned out differently. But unfortunately for them, it did not. So Texas is captured. Texas is annexed and uh, joins in 45. It's then captured by the American soldiers in 46. Um, Me uh, California basically rebels. Uh, they form their own militias, their own army, and they rebel against the Mexicans. It isn't really the U.S. military that takes California. It's primarily like the California militias that simply rise up and declare independence. There's not a lot of fighting that goes on in California. I mean, this gives you a scale of the battles. There was a big battlefield at San Pasqual, um, which is down by San Diego. The battle, I think, lasted one or two days and a couple dozen dead. Admittedly, anyone dying is a tragedy, but in the grand scale of wars and conflicts, a battle lasts a couple days and like 20 people died. It's really nothing uh, in the scale of actual battles. That's the kind of battles we had in California. The problem was, and one of the reasons this was so easy, Mexico was so far away. Mexico City is so far away. It's thousands of miles, practically. Uh, which Mexico City from a uh, Los Angeles area is what about 1500 miles it was so far Mexico couldn't really administer or control it it was simply too far away it was too easy uh, for the US to really do this so the US conquers here you can see the movements of Winfield Scott down here capturing Mexico City uh, Veracruz to Mexico City Fremont that's up here in San uh, Francisco area um, you have the battles down here, uh, Kearney. Um, in case you've ever never been to San Diego, there's a region of San Diego known as Kearney Mesa. There you go. I mean, that's why it's named that uh, for Kearney, who was a, a general who led and had victories. And uh, down here by San, I think I think he might have actually been. I, it shows him here on the map at San Pascal. I can't be sure about that, but he may very well have been involved in that battle. Um, interesting. Interesting stuff going on here. The fights that went on in California were pretty minor, very minor skirmishes, really, in the, the grand scheme of things. So Mexico surrenders. All of this was part of Mexico, and we end up getting all of it. Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, California, Colorado, I think parts of what Utah, uh, either full or part of about seven different states. Pretty much the entire we think of as the American Southwest. All of that was Mexico. All right. So we won. <coughs> Tricky, though. Lots of debate about what to do now that we've won. All right. So we have these territories, and now comes the issue. The issue that we discussed earlier during the election of 44. What are we going to do about slavery? Um, that's the problem. We wanted the lands. We got the lands. We defeated Mexico. What are we going to do about slavery? All right. Lots of people were split over this. Lots of people really split over this idea. Lots of opinions. Uh, many people opposed the war, first of all. They thought the war was unjust. We attacked a country which had never attacked us. We, we were totally the aggressors. We went to war with a neighboring country which had been sort of a business partner of ours, a trade partner, and we just took a third of their country. That's what we, The territory from Texas to California was about one-third almost 40 percent of the entire country of mexico we just took from it i mean that would be that would be like somebody invading the u.s and taking everything west of like the rocky mountains just like taking the entire western united states so about a dozen states i mean it's it's insane really um but we did that so many people said the war itself was wrong uh they believe polk was waging this war for the sole benefit of slavery simply to expand slavery into Texas all the way to California. He was. We know We know now he actually was. After the fact, his writings, um, his discussions, there's a ton of evidence that indicates that's exactly why Polk wanted this, was to expand slavery. Um, um, interesting how it all goes. So uh, in response to this, David Wilmot proposes that slavery be prohibited. Uh, he really proposed that slavery be prohibited in the new territories. That's the Wilmot Proviso. We're going to add all this new land, but we are not, not going to add slavery to it. He suggests this. Yes. 
Uh, many people supported it. Many people thought it was the right answer. In an unjust war, that the only good that's going to come out of it is we're going to add new free states. Well, the Wilmot Proviso is rejected. Congress does not vote on it. Congress does not vote positively. Um, it's rejected. Uh, many people believe it will actually start a war. Not allowing slavery will actually start a war because Southerners, the tradition had always been, as we moved across the U.S., the Southern states got to have slavery and the Northern states did not. So if we add Texas, but then don't add slavery, that would basically put a wall and stop the expansion of slavery, which would probably lead many Southerners to ask for war or succession, or excuse me, secession, to leave, to actually leave the Union. So the Wilmot Proviso would have probably led us to war. All right. Overall, our expansionist fervor does continue. Um, uh, oh, race mixing as well. There is a concern about that with this belief that Mexicans or Native Americans were inferior race. So if whites start settling Mexican lands, we're going to have racial mixing between the whites and the Mexicans. And there's a lot of Native Americans in Indian in uh, Mexican lands as well. Yeah, racism, purely racism, racism and bigotry. It's exactly what it is. Uh, there's certainly a concern about that. All right. Ultimately, people wanted this land. Ultimately, they wanted the territory. So we do get it. We do keep it. We don't give it back. We do finally sign a treaty. Uh, some people are mad at Mexico for resisting us. What? Mexico not wanting to give up a third of their country to some other country by force and conquest? Resisting us? How, God, how dare they? Um, Mexico did exactly what it should have done in any situation like this. An outside force invades your country, you fight back. So many people believed Manifest Destiny said it was our destiny to do this because some of how we are superior to Mexican people, apparently. Um, so how dare they resist us? We should be punished. We should take everything from them. Believe me, people talk like this. Newspaper, you find newspaper articles about this. The audacity of Mexico resisting our, our aggression of conquest. I mean, what in the world? Um, this isn't like ancient times, you know, when the, the Romans would show up and burn down your city because you didn't beg to join the Roman Empire. You know, this is, this is the way it doesn't work that way anymore. Well, some people still thought it did. Uh, many did fear that it could actually lead to a, 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 I don't know how to put it, a race war, I guess, or even a longer term war, an actual real long term war. This lasted less than a year. Uh, maybe Mexico is going to keep fighting because this is Mexican territory, which is full of Mexicans. There's thousands of Mexicans living there. So they might resist. They might rebel. There's just a lot of debate about where this is going to lead. Ultimately, Congress approves adding all the new territory. Ultimately, public opinion leans towards adding all the territory. On one hand, uh, Polk was wrong in what he did, and he did it for the wrong reasons. However, Manifest Destiny says we actually wanted all this territory anyway, so I guess we've got it now. We're just going to keep it, which is what we do. We signed this treaty with Mexico, Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, signed in 1848. Uh, we gave Mexico $15 million for basically a third of their country. Now, even back then, that wasn't much money. Uh, I mean, 50 years earlier, we purchased a third of what becomes the U.S. from uh, Napoleon for about $15 million. 50 years earlier. We now purchased another chunk of territory about the same size as Louisiana Purchase 45 years later and pay the same amount of money. It was worth worth way, way more than this. I mean, even in this time period, it was probably worth hundreds of millions at least. We gave them $15 million. We get We got uh, entirely what become about seven states or parts of seven states. The entire what we call the American Southwest is what now becomes part of this territory. Uh, yeah. Texas, California, New Mexico, Arizona. We have what Colorado, parts of Colorado, Utah. Um, I don't know. Oh, Nevada, of course. Duh. Nevada. Anyway. All right, 1848, Polk does not run for re-election. Too much criticism. 
he steps out. Uh, he, he wants to leave uh, sort of with honor. He believes that he has served America well, greatly expanding American territory, fulfilling manifest destiny, potentially expanding slavery. In his book, he's done everything. He's won. He did. He beat Mexico. They added the territory. Slavery does go into Texas. He won, basically. But opinion has really shifted against him, and so he doesn't want to run and be embarrassed in the election to be defeated. So he bows out gracefully and says, ah, I'm not going to run for your election. I'll let someone else do the job. It's hard to know. Public opinion was really against him. But also many people were really happy about the expansion of the U.S., Manifest Destiny. So it's hard to know whether he would have won or not. But he wasn't willing to take the risk. Uh, he also might have been in bad health, too. So that might have factored in. The Whigs, of course, choose ba -ba -ba -ba, Zachary Taylor. Why Zachary is a war hero? War hero, right? He did get his ass kicked by Santana at one point, but the rest of the time he was a winner, and he he done he had other victories, so he was sort of a war hero. Uh, they choose him. He was a Louisiana slave owner as well. That's important. Louisiana slave owner. Yes, the Whigs, who are anti-slave, choose a slave owner as their nominee. What? There's two reasons for this. One, the Whigs are desperate. The Whigs have had a bad run of it, really bad. I mean, everything that happened with William Henry Harrison and John Tyler, it's just, yeah, the Whigs haven't done very well. It's They've, they've been pretty much embarrassed. Almost since they've been a party, they have, have pretty much been, been stepping on their feet, just walking and just tripping over themselves. It's pretty bad. So um, they're, they're looking for a win here. And they are willing to go with a slave owner even though the Whigs are, their, their party platform is against slavery. But the second reason is Zachary Taylor is an unusual slave owner. I will, I will uh, say a little more about that here in just a second. Um, uh, they also choose, let's see who else is it they choose. They choose Lewis Cass. And hey, Martin Van Buren runs for like the fifth time. Man's got moxie. Yeah. All right. What is it that makes him special? What is it that makes Zachary Taylor acceptable for Whigs who are anti-slave? Because he's an anti-slave expansionist. He's a slave owner, but he he doesn't really think slavery should expand. He's one of these guys that believes slavery needs to stop expanding and needs to be limited. He thinks slavery simply needs to stop expanding, not ending slavery. But there needs to be a, a check put on it, a wall put on it. Now, he may have had an ulterior motive for this. Um, there is a belief that if slavery continued to expand, well, where were all the profits with slavery? Always on the frontier. The most wealthy, uh, expensive, the most profitable land was the edge of the slave territory. Um, uh, Arkansas, Texas, well, slavery's already in Texas, by the way, in case we're not aware of that. There's already slaves in Texas before all this even decided. So the most profitable land is Louisiana, Arkansas, the edge of Texas, the border there, uh, has the most profitable cotton-producing land. The issue being, if slavery continues to expand, the people who are already slave owners, say Louisiana, which was Taylor, will actually lose money. Their profits will drop as the core of the cotton production continues to move westward. It will leave Louisiana behind, which will actually cut into his pocketbook, Zachary Taylor's pocketbook. So one of his reasons for not wanting to expand slavery may be purely financial. Profit. He's going to lose profit. That's certainly one of the reasons we think he might have done this. Nonetheless, he's a slave-owning, anti-slavery expansionist. And um, he wins and becomes president. Yeah. The whole issue of slavery, man, has created some craziness in this time period. The 40s and 50s, it, it's just wacky. The kind of things that happen, the decisions people make, the, how the anti-slave party chooses a slave owner as their, as their president. Uh, yeah. The Whigs were desperate. This was it for the Whigs, by the way. 
Um, after Zachary Taylor, the wigs just fade away, which we'll get to in a second. Zachary Taylor wins against Cass. Ben Buren, not so good. Didn't do so good. Uh, 47 to 42, not a landslide victory by any means. He doesn't win the he doesn't even win the majority of America, but he gets the plurality. He gets uh, he gets the most votes, so he becomes the winner. Uh, he wins his state. That's always good, right? When you win your home state, uh, some other southern states. Uh, so these states win. This is how he wins. This is probably another reason they chose him. Therefore, he could bring southern votes. He won slave states as a slave owner. Had they not chosen a slave owner, they wouldn't have won those states. And then, of course, he wins many of the northern states because these are Whigs. So these are Whig territory up here. This is slave, uh, would have been Democratic territory down here. And he wins because he is a northern Whig, southern slave owner from Louisiana. <laughs> it's really weird. It really is. Um, he wins presidency. So there you go. All right, the Mexican secession, 1848. They gave us all this land. Well, they were forced to give us all this land. It's crazy. California. Ah, uh, that's Nevada, right? New Mexico, Arizona, Texas. Um, Colorado, Utah. I don't know what this one is. I don't know. Maybe this is Utah and this is Colorado. What do you think? Yeah, I'm not a geography teacher. I'm close though. I, I, I've got. I, I think I got five of the seven anyway. Uh, I don't know if that's a passing grade, but uh, almost maybe. Anyway, all right. Let's talk about California briefly. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. Uh, gold was found in California in 48, uh, up around Sutter's Mill, up uh, east of uh, San Francisco, sort of close to Sacramento. People from as far as Australia and Chile were rushing to California, literally around the world. By May of 48, we have 12,000 wagons crossing the U.S. We have 61 ships launched bound for California. And we believe by 49, we have over 80,000 immigrants into California in a year. 80,000 immigrants. And of course, they all came there hoping to strike it rich with gold. Uh, almost entirely men, by the way. Uh, they lived in terrible, uh, cramped uh, shanty towns, which are basically just little haphazardly built towns. They're not real towns. Uh, gambling, alcohol, prostitution was rampant, crime, violence. This was literally uh, um, the law of the gun. You lived or died by the gun. People were murdered all the time. Uh, you you had your gun. You slept with your gun. You held your gun all the time. It was it was it was live or die by the gun. This was really the Wild West right here. Let me tell you, California was a dangerous place to be around the gold rush. Uh, there are there's there's no one knows because records of course are very scant. But there's there's thought that probably thousands of people were cur killed, murdered. Uh, in the California gold rush between 48 and 50. Yeah, uh, most people never being brought to, most people never being brought to trial who committed these murders. It was insane. Uh, attacks were common based upon racial racism. We see attacks on Indians, Mexicans, Chile Chileans, Chinese. Um, uh, the racism was violent. Most of these 80,000 people were white. Uh, and they controlled everything. The whites are the ones who took the land. They made the claims. They would steal land and steal claims from um, uh, minority peoples, the peoples I just mentioned. They would force them into practically slave labor. Um, uh, typically, the Chinese, the Mexicans, Indians ended up becoming servants or slaves, uh, working for the white men, the white prospectors, the white businessmen, the white gold miners. Um, the early miners that got there in the first couple months after it was discovered pretty much took all the early, all the best deposits, all the best finds were, were taken up in the first few months, we would think. And therefore, everything that was left was pretty much just scraps um, or mining for gold or, sorry me, um, panning for gold. Literally panning for gold in the river. We all have heard of that. You've probably seen it. You might have even done it if you've gone gone somewhere where you could actually do that. I've done panning for gold. 
Uh, it's tough. It looks easy when they do it, but it's tough to actually get anything. Uh, yeah, life was really rough. If you were a minority, if you were non-white, if you didn't get there in the first couple months, you didn't get much of it. The wealth was not, it wasn't about sharing the wealth. Uh, so what did most people face? Over the two years of this gold rush, most people faced sickness, failure, and death. Percentages are unknown, but historians have thought less than 15% actually struck any type of wealth and kept it. I need to make that clear. Less than 15% found wealth and kept it because many people had never been rich before. And we have this actually this issue today. Do you know how many people who win the lottery actually have that money after five years? Only about 25%. 75% of people who win big lottery money spend it all within five years. Why? You've got millions of dollars. More money than you've ever learned and earned in your life, and you're going to just blow it all? Why? Well, two reasons. One, people have never had money, don't know how to manage money. So they do exactly that. They blow it all. And number two, there's a reason they never had money. They just didn't, they didn't know how to make money. They didn't know how to earn money. Therefore, they never had the money. So now they've got it. They, they want to enjoy life. They want to enjoy some things. They want to have a new car, have a new house. They've never had before. They've rented. They've lived in poverty. They've never had the money. They've never known how to use it. And they've never known how to earn it. So my vast majority of people who strike it rich in like lotteries, the money's all gone. Same thing here. Some people who struck it rich and became wealthy, they didn't know what to do with it. So they go and spend it all on women and booze. They get cheated or tricked out of it. They, of course, get robbed and murdered. Um, they do failed business ventures. They try to build a mine because they found some surface gold. It doesn't work that way. Just because you find some gold on the surface, and it actually was that way. You could just walk around the mountains up around the Sacramento area up there, and you could just walk around and find gold nuggets on the ground in 1848. Totally true. People got the idea that if they found gold on the ground, there was gold underneath the ground somewhere nearby. And they would start drilling in mines and digging mines. And very often they found nothing. So they would spend the wealth that they found out in the open, trying to make something more out of it. And often they failed. Less than 15% actually got money and actually held onto their money. Most faced sickness, failure, death, and, uh, yeah, miserable life. Um, there was a handful of women, but almost all the women who were in, involved in this gold rush were prostitutes. Um, hundreds of them, as a matter of fact. Uh, women weren't really allowed in the mining. Women weren't allowed to prospect. Really, women were not allowed to be involved in the process, generally speaking. Uh, Native Americans were terribly decimated by this. Uh, they received no protections under the law in California. California gave them no protections. They had had protections under Mexico, but now that California was in the hands of the U.S., the U.S., of course, has this history of not giving protections to Indians, so they got no protections. In 1848, we think there might have been 150,000 Native Americans in California. Uh, within a decade, that was down to about 30. So an 80% reduction in Indians over what a 10 year period. We believe that's pretty much due to death and murder and disease. Uh, murder and disease, I should say is what I mean. Mostly we think it's that. Um, their land was taken from them. We also know some white settlers actually uh, had extermination programs. Literally they got together groups of whites and sent out what we think of like a posse, which is a group of, of, of armed men, dozen strong, to go out and search out Indians to simply execute them, to kill them completely, just to execute all of them. We know this happened. Uh, Congress gave them no protection, um, ignoring treaties, and ultimately taking millions of acres of land on the West from Indians. Bottom line is most of California was Indian territory, and we took all of it from them. So it's just something we need to be aware of. Not that we're going to give the land back, but people need to understand where the prosperity of California came from. It was built on the backs of uh, Native Americans or taken from Native Americans. 
Uh, the creation of a slave-like trade among whites using Indians. Uh, Indians are used as sort of slave forced labor on white farms, working in the mines. And what happens after Gold Rush? Most of these people become, uh, who stay in California, become wheat farmers. And uh, many of them actually use Native Americans as basically slave labor on wheat plantations. Yeah, uh, pretty bad. Um, Mexican land was taken from them as well. Many Mexicans, of course, lived in California and Americans took all their land from them. Here's some interesting things about both Mexican and Indians. Once California became part of the US, uh, people wanted the land from the Indians and the Mexicans who pretty much controlled most of it. And so what they would do is they would go to court and they would sue over it and say, hey, we want this land. And their argument was thus, where's your proof you own the land? In American courts, you had to have documents, you had to have land titles, you had to have deeds, you had, had the actual documentation that says, this land is my land. They didn't have that. Indians didn't have that. Indians are like, we've lived here for thousands of years. We don't have a land deed. My parents, grandparents, great-grandparents have lived here for generations. They're buried all right here. We don't have a deed to the land. And the American courts would say, well, it's not your land then. Yeah. Um, Mexican, same thing. Uh, many of the documents that Mexicans had, either they had no documents, because same thing, they had been living on the land for years, or the documents they had were Mexican documents that only were really valid in Mexico, and American courts would say, where's your American documents? And of course, the Mexican men and women would say, we don't have American documents. We were on, we were in America a couple years ago. We were Mexico, so we don't have American documents. And the courts would say, well, all right, well, I guess it's not valid, so they would take their land. Uh, as a result, almost all Indians and almost all Mexicans lost all their land to Americans through these sort of legal machinations to where they simply don't have proof of the land, which, of course, is not surprising. Um, by the 1860s, what happened? The gold rush is over. The gold boom is gone. A handful of people have been rich. And most of the people in Northern California become wheat farmers. Uh, come to California to strike it rich as a gold miner, and a few years later, you're a wheat farmer. Which also ends up striking rich. Um, it really does. Uh, becomes a huge industry in California, actually, the wheat industry. Um, almost worth its weight in gold, probably. To some people, anyway. Eh, maybe. The gold run, the gold boom turns into the wheat boom. Interesting. Ah, uh, the early history of California. Gold mining region all through this, uh, this would be the Sierra Nevadas. Yeah, Sierra Nevadas. Instant metropolis, instant cities, of course. Why San Francisco? All those 80,000 people that came, uh, most of them either came through San Francisco or they ended up in San Francisco at some point or another. Even if they came from the east, the only real major city was San Francisco. And so most of them ended up making it to San Francisco or the coast at some point. So, yeah, uh, San Francisco became a, a center. Um, uh, major ranches, which were food supplies. These are food supplies, these major areas here for food. Major gold mines, all the little purple triangles. Outfitting center, that became Sacramento. This wasn't our capital, by the way, in case you're unaware. Our capital was not Sacramento initially. Um, Wow, what was it? You may even know, but it wasn't Sacramento, it was another city. And then it moved to Sacramento later. Yeah, I used to know this, but I've forgotten. Anyway, I don't have it in my notes. Gives you an idea what it sort of looks like. And today, of course, we have a handful of towns up here, but most of these are these are ghost towns now. I don't, I don't know if there's any active mines up there at all anymore. Could be. I have no idea. In case you want to see more of that chart up there, I'll move me down here. This shows sea passengers through San Francisco in 49 all the way up here. All these people incoming. And then 52, look at it changed. People leaving, people leaving, people leaving, people leaving. And then by 57, it's pretty much even of people coming and going, which is, 
which is actually not right, really. You should have more immigrants than immigrants. Immigrants with an I versus immigrants with an E. Immigrant with an I is when you're coming in to a territory. Immigrant with an E is when you're leaving the territory. Obviously, I is in and E is exit. So easy to remember the difference between the I and the E. Um, so ideally, you want more immigrants with an I because you want your population to grow. So having this many people leaving is not really good. But um, where are they going? Well, a lot of them are going to Australia. After California has a big gold rush, the next huge gold rush is Australia, I believe, which is in the mid 50s. Um, so again, same thing happened in Australia. We see people come from all around the world to go there for the gold rush there. All right, 1850, the crisis of 1850. Yeah, we're getting there. Not quite there. We're getting there. All right. So in order to get admitted to the Union, California, it ratifies a constitution. It is an anti-slave constitution. California decides it does not want to be slave. Now, that's OK, because that's the way it had been. The states were supposed to be able to choose on their own slave or not. Well, it had been that way. Congress has to step in. All right. So California wants to be admitted as an anti-slave state. Lots of debate in Congress about whether California could do this. The tradition for years had been the states got to decide. Well, here's the problem. California is mostly a southern state. Most of California would be in the southern half of the U.S., which up to this point in time had all been slave. So looking at it that way, California should probably have been admitted as a slave state due to its latitude. Well, so some people are debating and asking, well, are we gonna piss off the slave owners again? Could this lead us to war again? Because we're gonna add another state and we're gonna have the issue over slavery. Out of Texas, we gave them the slavery, but are we gonna do it in California? What's gonna happen? All right, debate includes several things. This is how bad it's gotten. This is how bad it is now. People are actually debating creating two countries actually debating creating two U.S.'s with a dual presidency. Two presidents, one over slave society and one over free society. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, some debate simply ending slavery. Let's just abolish it altogether. Let's just end it, be done with it. Um, that is not popular. It's popular with some, not popular with others. Uh, some believe Missouri Compromise should be extended. Remember, that was that 36-30 that, uh, line, 36 latitude 30, where everything below is slave, everything above is free. That would have pretty much cut California in half. So California would have been admitted probably as two states, one, one slave, one free. So it would have been two instead of one, maybe. Um, finally, the option that is, fi that is finally chosen is popular sovereignty. In other words, giving the power popular means the masses of people, and then sovereignty is who makes the decisions and who has the power to make government. So in other words, the people have the power to make government. That's popular sovereignty. Uh, make government, make the laws, whatever. So ultimately what they decide is popular sovereignty, giving every state the choice to decide whether they're free or slave. Now this had been this way all the way back to the 1820s. The states were supposed to write their own constitution and decide free or slave. However, within that boundary, you still were bound by the Missouri Compromise. Meaning if you were below 3630, you were supposed to be slave and above were supposed to be free. Now they're going to simply say, forget the 3630 line. It's entirely up to the states to decide free or slave. It's up to them. Many options. And the ultimate goal of all this was simply to avoid war. That was the goal, to simply avoid a civil war and disunion. That was the real fear. All right. So we come up with what we call the Compromise of 1850. Stephen Douglas comes up with this, and it has multiple parts, uh, five parts. One, two, three, four, and five parts. 
Stephen Douglas was a congressperson from Illinois, who we will be speaking more about in a minute. Illinois, Lincoln. All right, so Stephen Douglas, um, he achieves passage of five separate laws, which collectively become known as the Compromise of 1850. Fugitive Slave Act is the first. It gives federal support to slave catchers and makes slave catching now officially sanctioned by the United States government. All those fugitive slaves we talked about a chapter or two back, you can now go get all of them legally anywhere in the U.S., and the U.S. government will support you in the courts and legally, even give you money, potentially, to help support slave catching. Yeah. Very popular with slave owners. Not at all popular with pretty much everyone else. California is admitted as a free state. New Mexico is admitted as a new state, just a new state. They abolished the slave trade in Washington, D.C. Remember, the slave trade had been abolished in 1808. That was from outside the country. The foreign slave trade had been abolished in 1808. That was in the Constitution. But D.C. is not part of the U.S., technically. The D.C. is a separate federal district, which is actually not part of the United States, technically. Now, the reason for that is obvious. It doesn't want D.C. And, and government to be influenced by one of the states. So it's a separate entity that is associated with the U.S. Um, so that meant when slave trade, international slave trade was abolished in 1808, it wasn't abolished in Washington. So they could actually continue to buy and sell slaves right in front of the White House every single day, legally, and they did. Um, so one of the uh, one of the aspects of the Compromise of 1850 is to finally end the slave trade in Washington D.C. Finally end it. Uh, almost 40 years, well, 40 years after it had already been ended in the rest of the U.S. Remember, this is international slave trade. This isn't about buying and selling slaves between states. That's a domestic slave trade. That's perfectly legal. Um, this is international slave trade we're talking about here on E. Uh, and lastly, they established New Mexico and Utah with popular sovereignty, meaning they can decide slave or not. So Fugitive Slave Act, giving federal support to slave catching and makes slave catching now officially sanctioned by the government. You can go back and get your property that's run away, basically. California free, New Mexico and Utah admitted as new states or territories. New Mexico is a state, Utah is a territory. And then popular sovereignty will now apply to all new states or territories. In other words, the people in the state get to decide, get to vote. And then the slave trade abolished in Washington. This is what saves the Union for another 10 years. This is the only thing that keeps war away. But it lasts, what, a decade. Um, many people are already agitating for secession, meaning there's many people in the South that are already saying, you know what, it's going to happen. Eventually, we're going to have to leave the U.S. because so much of Washington and so other much other public opinion is about anti-slave that we are going to be forced to form our own independent slave country. Even in 1850, hell, even in the 1830s are talking about this. So there's many people that simply believe it is inevitable that war or disunion will occur. The Compromise of 1850 puts it off for a while, but most people still believe. Many Southerners, politicians come right out and say, if you even talk about abolishing slavery, you've destroyed us, you've destroyed the US. We'll turn around and walk away and secede from the Union the very next day, even discussing ending slavery. They're fully committed. They're willing to do anything now. The South willing to do anything and everything to maintain their economic power and superiority to the white majority, including going to war. This is an image resolving the crisis of 1850. Here we have senators debating 1850 compromise. Um, this is known as the antebellum era. era. Uh, antebellum meaning before war, I believe, before I think it's like, so this is that period, like the decade or two right before the Civil War, I believe that's what it means. Don't quote me on that. You can Google it. Um, anyway, this is the antebellum area right, right before the war. Uh, look who is participating in politics here. 
Look at who 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 are all the, the senators. I believe this is the Senate, right? Yeah. Who are the senators? A bunch of old white guys. All of them. All of them. Uh, look at the people who can't actively participate. They can only watch and observe. Men, women, children, and I don't know. Is there even anybody in, of color up there? Is there even anybody who is of color? Hmm. There's a couple of people in shadows. It's hard to really tell whether they're they're uh, African American or not, but nonetheless. Anyway, it gives an idea here that um, the people who run our country and make all the decisions, whether they are pro-slave or anti-slave, are all pretty much rich white guys. You all knew this. I mean, everyone everyone knew this in the time period. Craziness is today. It still is. Most people in Congress are still older white men even though half the u.s is female congress last i heard was 17 percent female so 83 percent male even though uh men make up about 50 percent of the population african americans are what now about 15 percent of the population they make up about five percent of congress uh three by like four or four or five percent of congress so Realistically, Congress should be way more of color, not just black, but just in general, people of color, and have a lot more women to actually effectively and accurately represent the American population. So in truth, even today, America is still pretty much run by wealthy white guys. Still. Um, it's obviously much better than it was, but still, we are a long ways from true political um and uh equality in america uh, among the ethnic uh, ethnic groups all right we'll now talk about the end of the second party system what do you want to talk about here anything here um there's your new mexico utah territories california admitted here slave states here this is it for the slave states i don't believe we had any more because there should be 15 right Six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 13, 14, 15, yeah. There's 15 slave states. I believe that's as far as we get. Uh, we don't add any more. And slavery never really takes over Texas. Uh, most of the other states, slavery is really conquers pretty much the whole state. But for the most part, we only see slavery in East Texas. Most of the rest of Texas, don't get me wrong, most of the rest of Texas is a desert. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if you've ever been to West Texas. I've spent some time in West Texas. Don't. Don't. There you go. It's just a freaking desert. Uh, it's terrible. Um, you know, there's counties in West Texas that are bigger than other states. Single counties that are bigger than other states. Anyway, yeah, don't go out there. Um, anyway, I'm a Texan. I can get away with saying that. Let's talk about the end of the second party system. Well, the first thing that leads to the end of the second party system, what does that mean? That is the second party system in america the first party system really refers to the the uh, democratic republicans and the federalists the, these are political parties the, really the first and the, the, we know the democratic republicans sort of split into two groups eventually the republicans sort of split into two groups but generally speaking we're talking about those early democratic republicans and federalists then we get the second party system which is the democrats and the whigs where we have a democratic party and the Whig party that survives about 20 years from the 1830s to the 50s so from the 18 i guess yeah i would say the 90s so from the 1790s to the 1830s was the first party system which is primarily the democratic republicans and the and the federalists then we have from the 30s to the 50s the democrats and the whigs that's our second party system and this is what ushers in the third party system which by the way is what we are still in today uh, we're still in the third party system and um, certainly no evidence that's ever going to change. Um, not, in, not, not in the future, not, not in any, any lifetime that we're, we're uh, going to be involved in, probably. All right. And what really begins to tear apart and end the second party system is the Slave Act. Uh, the Fugitive Slave Act is the absolute most controversial part of the Compromise of 1850. Uh, you either hate it or love it. There is really no middle ground on this. Um, this 
pretty much holds the union together for the next 10 years. Had this act not been enacted by Congress, secession would have probably happened in the 50s. They were ready. Southerners were ready. Carolina was ready. You better believe it. So, yeah, this may have actually held us together for another 10 years, for good or bad. Obviously, if, it, if the war had happened 10 years earlier, it would have been 10 years earlier of ending slavery. Probably, assuming the North won, uh, slavery would have ended 10 years earlier. So maybe this was a bad thing, if you look at it that way. Maybe there should have been no compromise. If the war was inevitable, hell, we should have just done it and got it over with. Of course, we can look back and know this. They didn't know this at the time. They were trying to prevent the war from ever occurring. Even though most people, we know from a lot of private writings and letters and documents and things like this, that most people in Washington fully expected a conflict to occur. It wasn't about if, it was about simply when. Uh, this, amounted, this amounted to the fact that federal judges in the North <laughs> were given a responsibility to determine the status of any slave, alleged fugitive slave. So the judges were supposed to determine the status of an alleged fugitive slave. Uh, so the entire power and authority to determine whether said black person was a slave or not a slave, escaped slave or not escaped slave, often based upon evidence that was so bad, literally cases were decided by a simple sketch that someone of charcoal on a piece of paper, which could literally have looked like a thousand people. And there were numerous cases decided with only that evidence of the word of a slave catcher and a charcoal sketch of what looks like, in most cases, if you can look these up on the internet, most of the cases they look like just some generic black man. Could literally have been a thousand different guys. Um, and these federal judges decide this and they usually decide against the African-American man. Occasionally women, although 90% of, of fugitive slaves captured were men. Um, they're given no jury trial. They're not allowed to testify. They have to sit outside the court in chains while the white guys inside decide their fate. And then someone comes out and says, you're either free or you're now a slave for the rest of your life. Again, although it should be noted, now and then people were put into slavery who had never been slaves in the first place. There's a book, in a, a book that came out in like the 50s, 1850s. But the movie just came out a couple years ago and it's 12 Years a Slave. It's a really good movie. Very, very historically accurate. Um, uh, he was a free black man that had never been a slave. He got captured and he spent 12 years as a slave uh, before he, he got free, um, even though he had never been a slave in the first place. That's what the Fugitive Slave Act did. It, it really made things crazy. It really did. Uh, people in free states immediately resent this. There's violence, there's backlash, there's riots, um, chaos really chaotic riots, fights, beatings. Uh, there were thousands of slave catchers, both white and black. There were hundreds of black slave catchers. Yeah, there were. Um, this was a career, folks. This was a good paying career. Um, Andrew Jackson, for, well, let's see, okay, I take that back. Andrew Jackson's, he made his money off a slave trade. I apologize, he wasn't a slave catcher. Uh, he made his money off of the slave trade. Many people did, though, become rich and wealthy on, on slave traders, uh, going to the north and hunting down black men and women, putting them in chains and carrying them back to the south. A lot of money. Really did. So this really uh, destabilizes the American political system. In essence, people look around and say it's not working. The Whigs aren't working. The Whigs are a failure. The Whigs' entire goal was to stop slavery and stop the expansion of slavery, to abolish slavery. And what the frack did they did? They, they, they elected a, a, uh, a slave guy. They elected a slave owner. So the Whigs obviously are not working. We can't trust the Whigs. The Democrats aren't working. The Democrats are all pro-slave, southern slave owners. So many people simply believe our political system is not going to work the way it is. It's not going to continue functioning. It is not working right. We have parties like the Whigs doing crazy stuff. And um, the issue of slavery is just escalating. So 
the political system just seems to start to collapse. The election of 1852 comes along. The whole issue, of course, is slavery. The issue of this election has nothing to do with slavery. That's all the people are talking about. That's all that matters. The expansion of slavery. Where's slavery going to go? Uh, are we going to abolish slavery? What are the rules going to be going forward? Because we know, anyone can look at a map and know, there are a lot of extra states that are going to be added over the next coming years. There's easily a dozen or more new states or territories that are going to be added. That this decision over slavery is going to have to be made over and over and over and over again. What the hell do we do? Um, what do we do about it? The Southerners tell us every freaking day, if you try to do anything about slavery, it's war. It's on. Done deal. And people in the North believe it. And the South, they uphold their word. They're good to their word. Um, they are good to their word. So the election comes along. The Whigs choose Winfield Scott. Again, another war hero. Winfield Scott from the, the uh, War of Mexico. Democrats nominate Franklin Pierce. Why Franklin Pierce? He doesn't own slaves, I don't believe. He's not a slave owner. I believe they choose Pierce because he's sympathetic to slavery. His opinion is thus. Slave owners own their property. They make a lot of money. They're a huge part of the American economy. Leave them alone. No regard for slaves, no regard for African Americans at all. Simply, we've always had slavery. It's a huge part of our economy. Let's just simply leave it alone. That seems to be his opinion. Um, yeah. So he's not exactly technically pro-slave, but he's, I guess, pro-status quo. Let's just keep everything alone, not abolish slavery. Just don't mess with it. Just leave things the way they've always been. He wins. He wins. Winfield Scott loses. The Whig party falls apart. Winfield Scott, remember, he was, Winfield Scott was the Whig. Pierce was the Democrat. Pierce wins. Winfield Scott loses. Um, and the Whig simply collapse. They never actually wage another major campaign. This was it for the Whigs. They're not technically over yet, but they don't ever have another real major campaign or a major victory again. They fade away over the next couple of years. Pierce wins. Pierce takes over, and he's an expansionist. Um, he believes in expansion both domestically and internationally. He might be our first president that really pushes for international expansion. Yeah. He negotiates a treaty with Japan. Um, <laughs> That's putting it politely. Pierce sends over a small navy. They sail up to Japan. They aim the cannons at Japanese cities that they can reach from the, the uh, ocean. And they start bombarding the cities and actually blowing up a couple cities. They then start negotiating with Japanese and say, we're going to destroy all of your cities we can reach with our cannons. We're literally going to decimate your entire coastline, killing who knows how many people, unless you sign a trade deal with us. Japan agrees, believing they have no choice. Uh, bear in mind, Japanese soldiers are still fighting with spears and swords and bows and arrows. Now, don't get me wrong, they're high quality stuff. I mean, they're high quality weapons. But they're not even using they're not even using firearms. They're not even using gunpowder. Um, the Americans have been using gunpowder and explosives now for 200 years. Uh, the Japanese are still using basically medieval weapons. Um, they, they 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 it's not a surrender exactly, but they choose to sign a treaty and comply. And the United States opens up Asia for trade by forcing Japan uh, by pointing a cannon at its head to sign with us. This happens uh, around 53, around the same time year, some same time around this year. So to simply say politely that um, he negotiates a treaty with Japan would certainly be really glossing over the reality. This was what we will, we will later years, I don't think we used it here, later years we'll call this gunboat diplomacy. Uh, 
how how diplomatic really is it? I mean, think about it this way. If someone's holding a gun to your head, literally holding a gun to your head, do you really have a choice? If you say no, they blow your brains out. So you know what you're going to do? You're going to say yes. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Whatever you want, sir. Absolutely no problem. Because you don't want to die. Yeah. So Japan agrees to trade with us. Uh, further, we we have another purchase here of another chunk of Mexico, the Gadsden Purchase. We purchased that specifically for a railroad across the southern border. Um, that chunk, you saw that on the map earlier. You'll probably see it on the map here again in a minute. So we purchased that for Mexico, which it becomes part of modern-day Mexico and Arizona. He also supports covert military operations in Nicaragua and Cuba. Uh, he almost starts a war with Spain. Uh, Spain claimed Cuba. Cuba was considered a Spanish colony. So when we start to invade Cuba, obviously for the sugar plantations and to expand slavery into Cuba, um, Pierce actually wanted to take over Caribbean islands and make them part of the US to expand slavery. Here's the deal, very simply put. He believed there was now so much resistance to expanding slavery across the US uh, he believed there was another direction to go. Couldn't go east. That's the Atlantic Ocean. We can't go west any further now because these new territories being added, New Mexico, Utah, California, they're all going to vote to be free. That's already happened and it's happening. So basically, the, the expansion of slavery in the United States is over. Pretty much Texas is going to be it. Every other state or territory that's come along in the last couple of years have all voted to be free. So. The expansion of slavery seems to be done in the United States with the 15 states it's at. So what does Pierce decide? We can't go west, can't go north, that's Canada, can't go east, we're going to go south. He starts, take, he starts coming up with plans how to take over more parts of Mexico, how to take over the Caribbean, even take over parts of northern coast of South America. Yeah. Uh, this was the decision to expand slavery south across the water into Central America uh, and claim these territories for the U.S. Same way we'd, we'd already claimed territories. Why not go ahead and keep doing it? Uh, that's what he wants to do. Uh, ultimately, Pierce becomes maybe the, maybe the most aggressive slave expansionist we had ever had. That's saying a lot. Considering how many presidents we had that owned slaves, how many presidents we have that were Southern uh, sympathetic to slavery. Pierce might be our most aggressive slave expansionist president we ever had. Uh, yeah. It became, it became public eventually. All this became public. That Pierce was basically trying to take over Mesoamerica, Central America to make it the expansion of slavery for U.S. interests. Yeah, he becomes a deceptive, power-hungry, slave inspectionist president. <laughs> um, terrible. However, the Democrats probably exactly what they wanted. That's what they wanted. They wanted a slave expansionist. And since they couldn't go north, west, or east anymore, it seemed obvious there was only one direction to go, and that was south. Uh, the Gadsden Purchase right there. That's the map you saw earlier. This was the purpose of putting a train line across the southern border. Uh, in essence, connecting the southern states. Weird irony is we do this here, but where do we actually connect the train line? It's not in the Gadsden territory. The actual train line east-west is connected in the 1860s in Utah. Which, what is Utah here? Is this Utah? Salt Lake City is Utah? Um, that's actually where the, the train is connected, where they drive in what is known as the Golden Spike. I believe that's Utah, uh, which is the final spike that connected the Eastern and the Western Railroads to where you could now, after 1860, I don't know, it was 1862-ish, uh, something around that year, you can now take a train all the way from New York to San Francisco and vice versa. Um, yeah. But the gas and purchase was created to do that. But ultimately, we ended up doing it up here. This was done first. There were multiple train lines, multiple train companies. So I, I guess this train company up here was more successful and got it done first. I don't know. There were multiple train uh, companies. 
All right. The final end of the second party system and what ultimately leads us into a new party, a brand new political party. All right, in 1854, a law is passed which repeals the Missouri Compromise from 1820. The Missouri Compromise was that 3630 line, which was this, oh, it's not on this map, never mind. Anyway, um, the Missouri Compromise was the uh, eight. The 3630 line, which bordered Missouri, which said everything above is free, everything below is slave. So we passed a law in 54, which repeals it. Um, there was no reason for it anymore. The Compromise of 1850 pretty much overruled the Compromise of 1820 with all new rules. So there wasn't even really a need for it. But what it does do, do another part of the law, is it forms two new territories. The Kansas Territory and the Nebraska Territory, pretty much in the central U.S. And of course, the question is, of course, every as it always comes down to the same question: Is Kansas and Nebraska going to be slave or free? The same damn question every time. Well, what they decide is that Kansas and Nebraska will be popular sovereignty, meaning the people in the state will vote and decide free or slave. Very simple. Only it wasn't. It actually becomes quite ugly. I mean, ugly to the to the level of multiple people dying. Uh, I think hundreds die as a result of what's about to happen. The Whigs, Northern Democrats. Why Northern Democrats? These were people who were Democrat-leaning, but they didn't really believe in slavery, but they still were Democrats. So you have Northern Democrats, which are generally against slavery. Uh, you have, of course, the Whigs, which are against slavery. And a new group which is now becoming a significant political group. Remember, previously I said multiple times, abolitionists were never a majority of America. Never at all were they a majority. They still really aren't. But they're a big enough group now that they have their own political power, their own political power base. There's now enough abolitionists with enough money and, and clout that they are starting to form their own political organizations. Well, these political groups, along with the Northern Democrats that don't really support slavery, and what's left of the Whigs form a brand new party, what is simply known as the Republican Party. This is the creation of the Republican Party. It is against slavery. It is, um, uh, they advocate uh, no permanent labor class, which of course would be slaves. Their ideals of entrepreneurship, starting your own business, the idea of the self made man. You're going to take care of yourself. You're going to raise yourself up, be self-made, be free, be independent. Um, all these kind of ideas. This is a mixture of Whig ideology, um, a mixture of national Republican ideology from the 1820s, 18 teens, and also a mixture of the Federalist ideology. So we have this new political party, which is taking sort of pieces of the Federalists, the National Republicans, and the Whigs to form a new political union, which they simply call Republican, meaning the implication being they are the ones who truly represent the American Republic. And America is really a republic. It's not exactly a democracy. It's really a republic, a representative republic. And they claim to really be the ones that represent America. And they are not friends of slavery becomes very obvious. All right, so all this is happening while people are going to Kansas. All this happens around the same period of time. Kansas now has thousands. Um, there are supporters on both sides of the debate. You have people in Kansas that want to uh, have slavery. Uh, you have some that simply want free soil. They, uh, they don't want there to be slavery, or people should be able to vote for it. Well, here's the deal. Kansas is right next to Missouri. Missouri is a slave state. So this is what happens. I don't have the cities on here. Uh, Lawrence, okay, Lawrence is one. The other one is Lee Compton. I don't have it on the slide. Lee Compton. Here's the shit. It becomes obvious that Kansas is going to vote a free uh, constitution. It's already been written. People find out about it. So Kansas is going to go free. Uh, Texas, uh, pardon me, um, uh, 
Utah Territory was going to be free. New Mexico Territory is going to be free. California was not free. It was obvious to anyone in the slave society that slavery was in trouble. Every other new state, every new territory from now forward was probably going to be free. That said something. That seems to be apparent that the public opinion is shifting against slavery. Since all the people who are adding new states and voting on it with popular sovereignty don't want slavery. This scares the shit out of slave owners. Well, next to Kansas is Missouri, which is a slave state. So what happens? Um, <laughs> the people from Missouri go into Kansas and vote on the Constitution, but they write a different Constitution. And it's a slave Constitution. They do this in Lee Compton, I believe, which is Kansas. Lawrence, Kansas is where the proper legislature meeting, the proper people are meeting, and they're voting on a free constitution, or they're going to vote as a free state. So it happens in 56. All right. So the pro-slavery people end up burning down Lawrence and trying to admit or trying to submit a slave constitution to Congress, a slave declaration to Congress. Just so you're clear, people in Kansas wanted to be free, but people in Missouri came across the state line, voted illegally, created their own slave constitution, all illegally, because they were actually Missouri residents, because they wanted Kansas to be a slave state. It erupts in violence, killing, murder, uh, towns are burned down, and John Brown comes into our story. John Brown. He's a very aggressive abolitionist literally a militant abolitionist. He attacks back in retaliation. He attacks back against the pro-slavery advocates. Uh, he murders five of them, just outright murder. Cold blood kills five pro-slave advocates from Missouri. Just kills them, or wherever they're from, I don't know where they're from, kills them. The pro-slavery people retaliate. John Brown actually gathers an army a, a, his own private militia army, and a war goes on in Kansas for over a year. This is what's known as Bleeding Kansas. For the better part of 56, you didn't want to be in Kansas because people were getting killed and shot and knifed on the streets over the issue of expanding slavery or not. It was bad. Um, thousands of people fled Kansas. They left the territory because of the violence, because they were afraid they were gonna get injured or killed by the violence. Um, entire towns emptied out. It was bad. Uh, eventually the military comes in, eventually the US military comes in to sort of stop it and sort of put it down, but it's, it's messy. And John Brown gets away with this. He commits multiple murders, him and his group, his, his uh, soldiers. He's never brought to trial, never uh, convicted of any crimes. Um, but we do know historically that he he committed murder of innocent people, uh, not uh, unarmed people. We believe that fully. Well, it's not the last time we're going to hear from John Brown. He will come back into our story again uh, in the next chapter. Um, or the very end of this chapter, which around 1860 he comes back in. Uh, ultimately, we had put over 200 people dead. Over 200 people dead. And finally, Kansas does get their free... Uh, constitution because it finally does become public knowledge that all those people who voted uh, on the slave constitution, the slave documents weren't even Kansas people. They were actually Missourians. Yeah. This is how bad it is. That this kind of crazy machinations to entirely change governments, to go across and vote in other states, to murder people in the streets over the issue of slavery. This is just sort of a reflection of what's about to occur. Well, let's talk about Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln's political, he was born in Kentucky, but he lived in Illinois. He had been a store clerk. He read Shakespeare, he studied law, hoping to be one of the middle class, culturally and economically. Um, very high aspirations. He was sort of the epitome of the self-made entrepreneur man who started poor, worked his way up, uh, 
and became successful pretty much on his own, through his own power, through his own will. That made him very interesting and intriguing to other people in the political spectrum uh, who saw him as sort of representative of what many people thought was part of the American ideology. He joined the Whig Party. Um, he became an experienced politician in Illinois. He was elected to Congress in 46. That was the only election he won before president. He ran for election about four or five other times and lost every time. Um, but he kept trying. He kept going at it again and again. He opposed the spread of slavery. Okay, good, right? He opposed the spread of slavery. However, he believed it was unconstitutional to end slavery. He believed there was no legal remedy to the issue of slavery. He was a fan of popular sovereignty. The states should get to decide. And he liked that the states were deciding to, against slavery. However, he believed it could not legally be ended. The founding fathers allowed it to exist. There was no constitutional way to end it, he believed. He was a, a basically an advocate for gradual emancipation, believing that uh, slaves should be given opportunities. In essence, slaves should be um, transitioned into indentured servitude, which is not permanent. You have to work off your labor, you have to work off your value, and then once they did that, they should then be given opportunities to become free. That was his view, uh, in the 1840s at least, that was his view. Uh, he did support the American Colonization Society. He was an advocate and a supporter of recolonization of African slaves. Bear in mind, Pretty much no one in America is now an African slave. By that, I mean they didn't come from Africa. Almost all, by 1850s, almost all slaves were born in the U.S. So to say that they were African slaves is really a misnomer. They are American slaves. They're American-born slaves of perhaps African ancestry, maybe. But, yeah. Uh, he believed in recolonization, sending them back. He stated unequivocally that free, a, a free black and a free white society would never work. Odd when you consider that there were hundreds of thousands of free blacks already in America that lived alongside whites, including Illinois, which was a free state. Um, admittedly, Illinois is mostly white, but the idea that the argument seems to be this millions, uh, there were, there were a couple hundred thousand free blacks, but there was about almost 10 times more slaves. So the idea of suddenly filling up America with millions of free blacks, he simply thought would never work. He believed our society could not handle it and it would lead nothing to violence and bloodshed, um, which does, some of that does indeed happen. He just simply didn't believe all those slave people, men and women, could be freed uh, and that it would work. Um, ultimately, um, he was considered to be a moderate middle-of-the-road guy. He loses his re-election bid in 48. Uh, if you're elected to the House of Representatives, if you're unaware, you have to run for re-election every two years. You no sooner than finish an election campaign and you get a few months of legislating and you have to go right back into running for election again. If you're a representative in Congress, your life is simply running for elections. You do it constantly. Now, no one imagined back in the 1700s when they decided this, that elections would be what they become today, where literally you spend a year running for election. 
most of the time, a full year. Um, it wasn't anything like back back then. It was not like that. So they never imagined that. Anyway, so he lost re-election in 48. Um, frankly, no one understood where he stood on slavery. He would, have a, he would have a debate or discussion where he would say he was against slavery. And then in the same breath, he would say, oh, but we can't end slavery. Uh, slavery simply has to be maintained. It's the way it's always been. And further, even though he's against slavery, he also wasn't really an abolitionist, um, and he really was unclear about his views on blacks in general, how blacks would um, how blacks would simply assimilate into society. That was one of his biggest arguments as well. He didn't know how black populations would assimilate. Um, suddenly, America is full of millions of free blacks. He just didn't understand how it would work. He thought it would simply be uh, too much of a stressor on society. This is what he really believed in the 40s, even into the 50s. Uh, he has a little bit of success with the Whigs. Eventually, he leaves the Whigs. When the Whigs collapse, he transitions over to Republicans due to his anti-slave views, and he is considered a diehard Republican, but still a middle-of-the-road guy that appeals to lots of people. Uh, however, that's also one of the problems. No one really understands which side of the argument he stands on. And by the 1850s, you can't really be in the middle. Lincoln is a middle guy. In the issue of slavery, Lincoln is right down the middle. However, to win elections in 1850s and 1860 requires you to choose a side. You cannot be in the middle anymore. In 1858, we have the very famous Lincoln-Douglas debates. This is about running uh, for a Senate seat, I believe, a Senate seat in Illinois. Uh, he becomes the leader of the Republican Party in Illinois. He runs against Stephen Douglas, uh, famous for the Compromise of 1850, really getting that done, for the Senate seat. This is where he gives a very famous House Divided speech, where he talks about how slavery divides America. But you need to really understand what he says. He says a house divided cannot stand and it must eventually fall. America must choose to be all free or all slave. There's simply no other choice. We must choose to be all free or all slave. He did offer that up as an option of slavery being made fully legal in all states across the entire U.S. He offered that up as an option. Uh, altogether, there were seven different debates between Lincoln and Fred, uh, between Lincoln and uh, Stephen Douglas here. Uh, seven different debates. Um, ultimately, what is Douglas, his side? Douglas chooses the side. Very clearly, he had slaves. I believe he actually had a slave mistress that he had children with. Um, I believe he had a live-in house slave black woman that he actually had children with. He was pro-slave in this way. He was, if, I, if I'm right on this, he was a Northern Democrat who did not believe in the expansion of slavery. And he thought slavery was problematic but he still supported slavery. Meanwhile, sleeping with his slave servant that he eventually has kids with, I believe. He ultimately supports white supremacy um, versus economic opportunity. Economic opportunity for blacks, to be clear. So Lincoln seems to come down on the side of economic opportunity for blacks ending slavery and giving them opportunities to to well frankly be free in a capitalist society which means potentially you're free to become rich potentially um he did not advocate equality lincoln did not believe in racial equality we know he wrote from his own his own words his own diaries his own letters he doubted that Black people were could ever rise to the level of whites. So he advocated 
potentially ending slavery, economic equality, but not equality. Economic opportunity, sorry to make that clear. Economic opportunity, but not equality among the races. This is not a, a dig on Lincoln. This is actually typical of the time. He's not unusual. He, that's really sort of my point. He's an average middle-class white guy from the North who says slavery is bad, but black people are still inferior. Not a dig on Lincoln. It simply means he's like most other whites, even those that are against slavery. Slavery is bad, but blacks are still inferior to whites. Um, and Lincoln believed that. Uh, we know this for a fact. His writings, his diaries, his letters to uh, to his wife, I think, um, is it Martha? Martha, maybe? Um, yeah. He did not believe in black equality, but he also did not believe in slavery either, it seems, by the 1850s at least. In the 40, it's really unclear. But in the 1850s, he seems to have finally chosen a side. And the house divided is ending slavery, potentially. Potentially ending slavery. Uh, although he does believe it has to be left to Congress. Ultimately, Congress must decide whether slavery continues or not. Not his decision to make. He says that clearly in one of his speeches um, around the time he gets elected. He says, I will not decide the issue of slavery. It is not for me to decide it. It is not within my power to decide the issue of slavery. The only ones who can decide this is Congress and its wisdom could decide the issue, not me. Um, the Democrats, on the other hand, were very divided. The Republicans chose Lincoln. Uh, he lost that election, by the way. He lost that 58 election for the Senate seat. Because again, it still wasn't 100% clear where he stood. He still seemed to be almost in the same breath advocating pro-black and anti-black all at the same time. It still wasn't necessarily clear. Stephen Douglas is very clear. It's all about white supremacy. Hands down, white supremacy. Um, he wins. He wins the seat in Illinois. And bear in mind, Illinois is not a slave state. And yet it chooses to side with the slave guy, the slave-leaning Democrat, who I believe, again, owned, he had, he had slaves. Um, I believe. I don't have that in my notes, but I believe so. Um, the Democrats were divided on who to decide to run because they were really torn. The Democrats were now really two parties, not officially, but effectively two parties, the Northern Democrats and the Southern Democrats, which usually went by the, usually by the name of the fire eaters. I'm not sure where that comes from, but just focus on the fire word, which means aggression, violence, which means, um, yeah, uh, yeah. The Northern Democrats want to stop the expansion of slavery. Not in slavery, just stop the expansion of it and let, let the states decide, basically, their supported popular sovereignty. And the Southern Democrats wanted to find someone who was really gung-ho pro-slave. So the Democratic Party is really split between the North, which is much more moderate, more more about peace, um, and potentially limiting slavery to some degree. Which, of course, Southerners see that as any, any, any attempt to limit slavery is the beginning, beginning of the end. So for Southerners, even discussing limiting slavery in any capacity, which Congress was discussing this, Northern Democrats were discussing this, that means that translates very clearly to Southerners ending slavery. So the Democratic Party is really split. The Republicans, though, they coalesce under one man. They generally decide there is one person for them who has the best chance to win, and his name is Abraham Lincoln. The Republicans choose Lincoln. The Democrats are split. Uh, the moderates versus the fire eaters. Moderates in the north, fire eaters in the south. The ones that are more moderate on the issue of slavery and the ones that are very, very pro-slavery in the south. Um, did I miss something here about John Brown? I might have. 
let me back up for a moment. Hell yeah. I totally skipped a page. Um, Democrats were divided, moderates, blah, blah, blah. Then, ninth, then 1859, John Brown comes back. John Brown of the famous uh, from uh, Bleeding Kansas, who pretty much took the law into his own hands, murdered people, and created a little guerrilla war that resulted in over 200 deaths. Uh, vigilante justice, baby. He was a criminal, sure as shit. He should have probably already been arrested and executed. He wasn't, though. He was an anti-slave guy. All right, he leads a raid on Harper's Ferry, Virginia. Why does he lead a raid on Harper's Ferry, Virginia? Harper's Ferry, Virginia is a federal arsenal, a weapons arsenal. John Brown makes it clear in a manifesto that he has nothing, his plans are nothing short than a revolution. He's going to lead a revolution. He's going to fix what wasn't fixed by our founding fathers 100 years earlier. He is going to fix the biggest glaring issue of the American Revolution and the Constitution, the issue of slavery. He wants to lead a whole other revolution to end slavery, um, which should have been done already in his view originally when the Constitution was written. He ended up with a whopping 20 people in his rebellion. Americans talk rebellion, but when it actually comes down to it, ugh, yes, it's nap time. Uh, when it actually comes down to it, they're not really that committed. Um, 20, 20 people. Uh, white and black, free and slave. He held out for two days. Remember, Virginia is a slave state. Um, this rebellion of his does not coalesce. He holds out for two days. And eventually it's actually brought to an end by this man, who we will talk quite a bit more about in the coming chapter. General Robert E. Lee, who is an American army officer of the United States military. Eventually, he brings down John Brown, uh, shoots him himself, gets shot several times. John Brown does. He's dragged out. Uh, they eventually get him out of Harper's Ferry. It's kind of ugly and messy. He's found guilty of treason, which he was, and he's hung, which he should have probably been hung for what he did in Kansas already a couple years earlier. What does this mean? The significance of this is is really two things. One, I like to introduce it because we don't have to even talk about it really. I like to introduce Robert E. Lee here, who was a, a Southerner, but he was a U.S. Army officer. He supported the Union. He followed the orders of the president. Okay, he did what he was supposed to do. He was a patriotic man. When the war begins, he leaves and joins the South. He becomes the general for the South, the slave states. Um, Robert E. Lee, I mean, he's not, he's not saying he's not a hero or something like that necessarily. He was a hero of the South, still is a hero of the South. Um, but he did his duty. To the North, he did his duty as an army officer, as in the U.S. military. And then when the South secedes, because he's a Southerner, lives in the South, he does his duty supporting his people in the South. Not giving him a buy. Um, he was the enemy. But it could be said that Robert Ely really believed in his job as an army officer. Um, he just uh, was no longer employed by the U.S. when all this happened. He was now employed by a different authority. And, of course, the issue of John Brown is important. Because John Brown really, all of the things John Brown does is what really is sort of a foreshadowing. What happens in Kansas? Then what happens three years later in Virginia? It's it's a foreshadowing of everything that's about to happen to basically orders of magnitude greater. It is the beginnings of the war, really. It starts all the way back in in in, in uh, Kansas, really. The beginnings of what are is going to lead to the greatest disaster to ever strike the United States before or since. Uncomparable to really anything else, the American Civil War. John Brown's executed, as he should have been.
Democrats are incredibly split over the issue of slavery. They can't decide who is going to. Um, uh, oh, oh, I do want to mention that um, 17 men were actually found guilty of treason and hung. 17 were hung by this. Big mass execution, one of the largest ever. Not the largest, but one of the largest ever. Uh, Brown was condemned by Republicans and Democrats alike. Everybody condemned his actions because people didn't want war. Even the Southerners that secede don't want war. Uh, after all, what do they call the war? The war of Northern aggression. They blame the Northerners for it. Um, they didn't want war. But I think anyone, anyone in the know, anyone who was versed on the subject understood what this was going to lead to. Democrats couldn't decide who was going to run for president. Republicans did, though. They decided on Lincoln. Uh, Lincoln runs as a free soil. Um, free soil platform, meaning no slavery in the West. Not, not abolishing slavery exactly. He simply believes the Western states should basically be free states. Not even popularly sovereign. The Western states, all these new states we're going to add, should simply be free states. Uh, he was a, a, a person who was still sort of moderate, appealed to a broad range of voters, from small town farmers to the city wage earners. He argued free soil, no slavery in the West, um, generally anti-slave, generally anti-slave, although still not 100% clear. Because even in even in 1859, we still hear, hear him mention things about um, the American Colonization Society, or the one which were the ones who recolonized freed slaves back to Africa. So he, he even still mentioned it as late as 59. So he's still quite a bit shaky on the race issue. The slave issue is pretty clear. He does. He's he's definitely not. He's he's definitely anti-slave. But the idea of equality and racial equality of some sort, he is still really iffy on that. He really is. Lincoln wins the election. Um, Anti-slave, but not racial equality. Uh, he still believes uh, it was probably better for African freed slaves to go somewhere else. Still not really believing whites and blacks can live together in a large society with large numbers of, of free blacks. Stage was set for disunion. It's pretty much a done deal. All that's left is the crying and the dying. Abraham Lincoln wins here, 40% of the vote. Not good. Not good at all. That vote's kind of poor. He doesn't even, he doesn't even actually get 40% of the vote. Uh, had there not been this big split, eh. I mean, look at the numbers. Add Breckenridge to Douglas. Both Democrats. Add those numbers. What's that come out to be? By the way, that comes out to be about 50%. Had the Democrats not been split, Lincoln would have got his ass handed to him. The problem plaguing Lincoln in 60 was the same problem he had against Douglas in 58. He was simply wishy-washy on the slave issue. He was simply taking the middle gray road. Um, not no pun intended, he couldn't decide which side he was on. He was simply going for the gray area in the middle. He couldn't choose. Eventually, he comes down on a side, but it's a couple years, really, before he, he truly chooses a side. Even in the election of 60, he is still middle of the road uh, on the issue of blacks in general. So yeah, luckily we had the big split election. If it hadn't gone this way, almost assuredly Lincoln would have lost again, just like he lost uh, to Douglas, and we very well could have ended up with President Douglas, which would have been very interesting because Douglas was a Northern Democrat who had slaves, but he he uh, slave or slave servants. Um, he didn't, he didn't necessarily believe in slavery anymore. So I don't know how that would have worked out. doesn't matter. didn't happen. Anyway, 
there you see it. That's how it turned out. That's the end of the chapter. The next chapter is the war. That's what we'll get to next. Thanks for sticking with me through it. Take care.